All right. We are continuing in our uh, breakdown of our sandbox, our vision, our guiding principles to help ground us as we move forward and <clears throat> visit our future. Does the float look great back there? I mean, I, and I love what we have on that. I don't even know if Joey's back there to hear that. So, oh, he is. He, he waved, so he got that. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, that's part of who we are. We need to <laughs> remember our past, but we also have to understand that we are moving into the future, and that can be scary. And it's what do we hold on to, what do we need to change. And these help us know what we're going to hold on to. Principles that we're going to stay true to, even in the midst of a changing world and the need for a changing church. Um, so what have we talked about? We focused on being Christ-centered, right, the first time. That's our first guiding principle. It means Jesus first and foremost. Today's the scripture I read, part of communion Falls back into that, right? As if we're going to be a Christ-centered church, then we've got to do what Jesus says. Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to do what I say. So it all ties in. And we're going to hold true to that first and foremost. And that was reinforced with the second one, which was being biblically led. Uh, So you see how these all start to play together. So if we're going to be a Bible-believing church, We're going to believe that the Bible is true, not just a collection of writings or stories or nice thoughts, but that it's true, that it's God's Word, His revelation to us, His relationship with us, His plan for salvation for us is all laid forth in His Word. We're going to believe that's true, and we have to follow it as well. And, And, you know, this is not just coming out of nothing. This is part of our foundation. Talk about remembering our past, because it's Thomas Campbell who said, you probably heard this before, that this is what we're going to be about. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we're silent. It's that same idea. That means we're going to be a biblically led church. We're going to believe that the Bible, we're going to let the Bible guide and direct us on what we do and how we do it. Right? So we have to look at it. I mean, that means you've got to use the Bible as that evaluation tool. So, if we're doing stuff that the Bible, that's not in the Bible, do we need to examine it? Got awful quiet. That's disciples of Christ. If we're going to be biblically led, then we not only ask, what would Jesus do? We have to ask, what does the Bible say? And are we aligning ourselves with what the Bible says? Let's make a choice there. Uh, and these are a, a great lead into what I want us to talk about today, which is our next guiding principle, which you know what it's going to be. It's like not going to be a surprise on what's coming up. Um, and this is probably one area, one of the guiding principles that, that young people, and I'm saying 40s and under, this is what we're seeing today, this is what I read, this is what you hear on blogs, uh, doesn't matter whether they're liberal or conservative. Doesn't matter. This spans that. But they're all passionate about the same thing. They're passionate about missions passionate about what they can do outside the church. Because what they see, what they see with us in the denominational churches, that all the denominational churches are concerned about is survival, circling the wagons. All denominational churches are concerned about is protecting the denomination, protecting the brand, being who we are, not reaching out. That's one of the reasons, I mean, there's many that we have all these independent Christian churches popping up all around, like Simple Church, says they want something different. And missions is a huge part of that. People want to be part of something else. The, The maintaining a church is not a priority. Serving the world is. So why do we do mission work? Well, it's going to tie back into our first two. If we're Christ centered, and we're biblically led, then we have to take the Great Commission seriously, right? That's what we've tied up with our mission focus. Passage we all know from Matthew 28. Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, stay and make disciples of all nations. Oh, it doesn't say that, does it? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey. I 
So I think I've said it before. Everybody knows the Great Commission, but we forget that last part. Forget that last part, which also tied back into communion. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Right? So it's more than just go out and baptize and teach people about Christ so that they get baptized. It's teaching them all that Jesus taught. Right? And if we're going to be Christ-centered, we're into that too. So we have to ask the, ourselves the question is, are we going to take then the Great Commission seriously? How do we know if we love Jesus? Do we see a vision? Do we, can we catch a vision to see others enter into an authentic, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? That's something that we'd want to be a part of. Would we want to be a part of seeing others come into an authentic, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? And don't shake your head yes if you don't really mean it. Because God knows whether you mean it or not. We've got to decide if that's our passion. Is our passion going to be about reaching it to others, helping them have an authentic, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? And if we're going to say yes to that, and it's going to require a go. It's going to require action. Sharing the gospel is one of the most important callings a follower of Jesus Christ can have. If we believe, that's where it hits, if we believe in the power of the gospel to save sinners and the power of biblical truth to change lives, then we've got to be committed to sharing that. You can't sit on it. We've got to be committed to taking that out. Period. But here's what happens. Here's what happens. We say, you know, we, we really don't have enough money to do missions. We, we don't have enough money to support a missions budget. So, churches stop being a tithing church. It would be a thing. 20, 30 years ago, most churches were. I, 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 don't remember about the history here or not, but most churches were tithing churches. 10% off the top went to missions. But budgets got tight. That got cut. Right? Churches started stopping to focus outside and started focusing inside. And I know it seems counterintuitive, but the more outward focused a church is, the more growth a church is going to see. The more inward focused a church is, well, they die. If you want to see church growth, you've got to be active and focus on without, outside instead of within. And we become more about concerned about people out there than we do about ourselves. That's when transformation happens. That's when miracles happen. That's when things change. But it's a decision we have to make. Mission signifies purposeful movements. Being sent from one place to another for a purpose. Jesus' disciples understood this. They were the first to be sent out. Right? When Jesus had His disciples, He helped teach them what they needed to know about spreading the word. And then what did he do? He sent them out. He didn't say, let's just stay here. We'll gather together and people will come and find us and hear about us. I mean, people did that anyway. But Jesus was intentional about sending them out. Sending them out to do his work. Now, we didn't include this scripture because we wanted to keep things uh, kind of short and tidy, easy to remember. But... I want to add this as part of our imperative for missions. Again, this is Jesus speaking, so Christ-centered, biblically led. It's in Acts. Jesus said, It's not for you to know the time and the dates the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And Basically what Jesus is saying, and you can see here, uh, Jerusalem, can you already, yeah, there it is, now it got cut off. Jerusalem, Judea, got cut off. And Samaria, uh, and the ends of the earth, it's up there. Basically what Jesus was saying is he was putting out a pattern for taking 
the gospel out. And what he says, what I love, he says on that, can I go back? No. That you will be my witnesses. So if we're going to do what Jesus says, if we're going to take Jesus' word seriously, if we're going to be biblically led, then Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. Not you can be, you might be, if you choose to be, you will be my witnesses. And Jesus is saying, what I love about this passage is basically Jesus is outlining Jerusalem, which is where he was, Judea, which is the bigger area he was, Samaria, which was the adjoining country. Remember Samaritans, not good. Uh, and then he adds, if you don't get it, the ends of the earth. So he's painting a picture of going out. Starting within, starting in your area, in your community, and then going out. And we have a choice. We either do what Jesus wants, or we do what we want. Jesus says that we are to go out and be witnesses in Shreveport, Louisiana, the United States, and the country. And so we can either do that, or we can say, no, we're not going to do that. And uh, if you don't know the hard part about that, you need to be in Bible study where we've learned where if you do what you want, not what God wants, it doesn't tend to work out as well for you. We have a purpose. We have a mission. We've been given directives. Yet we lose sight of that. We change our focus. If we're not careful, churches begin to accumulate various programs many of which were legitimate when they started, but over time, those running programs forget what the church's mission is and drift off course. Pretty soon, the church becomes cluttered with cherished programs that keep everyone busy, but we've forgotten the main thing. We're doing many good things, and many churches are doing many good things, but we've forgotten the main thing. So it's important to answer and keep going back to the question, what is the church's mission? What is it? In a nutshell, the church's mission is to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel to the lost and making Christ-like disciples who make Christ-like disciples. That, at least that's the imperative that Jesus gave us. Another way to say it is the mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit and gathering these disciples into churches that they might worship and obey Jesus Christ now and in eternity to the glory of God. And when you look at the mission statement that we put forth, grow with God, grow with others, grow in discipleship, we've taken the two commands Jesus gave and put them together. Right? Jesus gave the command to love God and love others. What's the most important commandment? We know that. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Locally and everything from your doorstep, your city, your town, to the ends of the earth. We are King's Highway Christian Church. Yes? No? Yes? Maybe? Uh, we're here? Somewhere? They had free coffee, so you showed up? Oh. If we are going to follow Jesus, then we have to be a mission post. We're loving God, loving others, and taking Christ's message to the end of the earth is our priority. Now, I'm not saying you don't have a worship team or a Christian education team, but what I'm saying is all those need to be a part of helping prepare and equip people to go forth. Uh, the problem is we get too caught up in all the things that need to happen internally and we forget about going forth. And we have an opportunity today. We have to have our house in order. And we have an opportunity today right after this service, our mission team, our worship teams, our worship and outreach and all of our teams are going to be on tables here uh, in the back and give you an opportunity to see them and know what they have going on. And they're important. We need to be a part of those. We need people to be a part of helping organize our worship services, our membership activities, our stewardship activities. We need to have people be a part of that. The problem is we can't use those to lose sight of what our mission is. Those are equipping tools. 
But too often we let those be the end all be all of who we are. Those help prepare us to go forth. And that needs to be the focus of all. And as people have come around to the Sunday school classes from the Epiphany team and talked to the classes, I mean, we need everybody to get around these principles. As a Sunday school class, as a worship team, how can we be equipping our congregation to go forth? I hope you'll take a minute to stop by and look at some of the different teams we have. We need your help to accomplish our mission. Remember, those are things to help accomplish our mission, not to replace our mission. Who wants to stand before Jesus and say, well, we wanted to carry out the Great Commission, but we had to take care of ourselves first. Good luck with that. Second, reiterating the church's mission is to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel to the lost. Breaking that down. To glorify God is to make Him look good as He truly is to others. The gospel is the good news. And it's the heart of glorifying God because God sent His own Son to pay the price for sinners and He can offer forgiveness of sins no matter what you have done. And the gift of eternal life to those who believe in Him. Jesus' ministry was centered around going out and proclaiming this message. Because that's what He did, right? He went out. Jesus didn't sit, He went out. In the Gospel of Mark, now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the Gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. He sent the disciples out to give this message and He sends us out to take this message out. Christ entrusted us with the responsibility of continuing the work He started. Right? He was here for a finite time. But think about if those disciples wouldn't have accepted the Great Commission. You wouldn't be here. Think about the generations that have all come before you that have accepted this message to share the Gospel. That's what's got you here. What's going to get the next generation here? Church's mission is to glorify God by making Christ like disciples who love God and one another. Doesn't get any simpler than that. The Great Commission isn't just to make converts, but to make disciples who will be obedient to Christ. We're to baptize so they're united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Death to our old life and being raised up to new life, but we're to teach them all Jesus commanded. And that takes a lifetime. But again, sometimes that's what we get focused on. Well, I'm still in the learning stage. A person professes to know Jesus as Savior, but is not seeking to grow in obedience to his commands then their profession is shaky at best. Same thing. Who wants to say, I understand, Jesus, that I'm to learn about You and obey You and do what You command. I was going to get around to that. Perhaps you wonder, what are Jesus' commands? There's so many in the Bible. Where do you start? How do you begin? Jesus made it easy for you. He broke it down into... Two, love God with all your heart and soul and love your neighbor. And the second one? Yeah, there it is. That sounds a lot easier than it is to live out. That's why we have to study the Bible to know how we go about loving God and how we go about loving neighbor. But I tell you, can't love our neighbors sitting in a building.
following up my opening, the church's mission is to glorify God by making Christ-like disciples who make Christ-like disciples. If we're not making disciples who make disciples, then we're only talking to ourselves. Be like doctors that only see people who are well. What good does that serve? Jesus came to call sinners to repent. Those repentant sinners are to go and make other disciples who repent and believe the Gospel. It's a multiplication, replication process. And that's got to continue. Each person that becomes a disciple has the responsibility to make other disciples. Each of us is a product of that process and the future requires us to be part of that process. It means getting involved with people. And people are messy. I read online about a British bus bus company that received complaints that their drivers were speeding past lines of 30 people or more that were waiting on the bus. The company defended its drivers stating, it is impossible for the drivers to keep their timetable if they have to stop for passengers. The company also commented that if you get rid of the people, the system works fine. I wonder if that's gotten into the church say the same thing about church? We've got a bunch of those outsiders in here. Things might not be the same. They might not work the way they're supposed to work. But then we lose sight of the purpose of the church, don't we? To glorify God by proclaiming the Gospel and making Christ-like disciples who make Christ-like disciples. If we focus on anything else, it gets us off course. So you say, all right, so what? Sounds great. I'm on board. What are you asking me to do? Where's the rubber hitting the road on this? I think there are two levels where the rubber hits the road on this in the practical aspect for us as a church. Participation and financial support. They can go hand in hand or they can be separate. If we're claiming the Bible is true, if we're claiming Christ is our authority, then if he's commanded us to do mission work, to me it doesn't seem like there's a choice. But you always have a choice. I look at mission work in three ways. It's a rubric I started a few years ago. Local, national, and international. If you break down what Jesus was saying in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, it's basically what he was saying. Local, national, and international. So what's local mission work? Well, the food bank, the Highland Blessing Dinner, Mary's Box out back, the Shreveport Pregnancy Center. Ways that we can get involved in our community helping those that need help. That's easy. Everybody can be involved in local mission work. And I think that's our first and primary responsibility. I think that's why Jesus put that order to them is that we have a responsibility to those who live around us to serve our community. So what do we do with that? Here's my challenge. Sunday school classes. Let me know how you're going to serve the community. What are you going to do? I'm not going to ask you to come up with a list of 20 things. That'd be great. But how about one thing? What's one thing your class can do to serve the community? What you're going to take on and say, you know what? We're going to be following these directives. If Jesus said we're going to be mission focused, then how can we as a class do it? How about as an individual? How would you like to serve the community? And I want you to notice something that I said in both of those. I didn't ask Sunday school classes to come with the list of how the church can do it. I didn't ask you to tell, say, what do you think the church ought to do? Because that's what we love to do. If we're honest, right? We come up and say. Uh, Pastor, I think the church should be involved in the mission center over there on the line. Okay, thank you. We love to do, because somebody should do it, right? It's a good thing and somebody should do it. So I don't want to know that. I don't want to know what you think the church should be involved in. I want to know what you're going to be involved in. Sunday school classes, individuals, how are you 
going to serve the community. And if you've got a way and you want to invite others in the church to help you, hey, that's great. We need to take responsibility ourselves for how we're going to serve locally, not for how we want to see others. Second, we have a responsibility to take the gospel to our, uh, to our nation. That's how I break it. How are we involved in the bigger part of the United States? And right now, our youth are our greatest evangelism opportunity in the United States with our youth mission trip. These kids gave up a week and adults to go and to went to Colorado and put their faith in action. You think, how is this mission work? Because they are talking with people that, and I've seen this time and time, have given up hope on finding help. People that have are struggling. And in Colorado, there were people really struggling. But as I've, as I've done this for 30 years, there are people that didn't think anybody cared about them. Yet to find some teenagers come and care enough to help them out by making repairs on their home and talking to them about Jesus because we invite them to be part of our devotion time where we talk about Jesus and share faith. It makes a difference. It changes the lives of the people they interact with and it changes the lives of our kids. But there are other ways. Maybe we could put together a team and work on a habitat house in Mississippi or Arkansas or Texas. Something closer. What will you do? What will you be a part of putting together to help take the message out? And the third, Jesus commanded the ends of the earth. And this is where I see foreign mission work. Because it's easy for us just like churches want to circle the wagon, we want to think that mission work doesn't extend beyond our own city or our own country. But Jesus clearly commanded when He said to go, to go to the ends of the earth. To go out there and make a difference in people's lives. And it works. I've seen it. We have to be part of it. So I want to present to the congregation two opportunities for foreign mission work. And if you read the newsletter article, then you know where I'm going. One person we've already met. You might remember it's been, I asked somebody about that, and they're like, ah, oh, that seems like forever ago. When I first was here, Patty Sue Arnold from Casa de Fe uh, uh, Orphanage in Ecuador came and spoke to us and talked to us about the orphanage there in Ecuador. Um, Casa de Fe is an orphanage in Ecuador, and they're desperate for people to come and help work on the property. The one thing about an orphanage, and this is a self-sustaining orf orphanage, is there's tons of things to do. If you can sit in a rocking chair and hold a baby, you're needed. If you can work outside helping the, the, getting the crops, if you can work outside helping to repair some of the buildings, you're needed. An orphanage is great because it doesn't matter what your skill level is. There is something for you to do to help make a difference in the lives of these children that are forgotten. That's a picture of what the orphanage looks like. Um, they need people to come and love on them. To show them that they're important. To bring Christ's message to them in the flesh. You know, that's what we are. We're just to be Jesus' hands and feet in the flesh. To be out there loving and sharing Christ with these kids. They need to know that they are loved. Because most of these kids are kids that have been abandoned. And having people come and love on them goes a long way. This is a way for us to fulfill the Great Commission in taking the love of Christ from Highland to Ecuador. From King's Highway Casa de Fe Orphanage. Who will go and serve? I'd like to put a team together to go to the orphanage um, and serve. To take a week and go out and love on these children and help this orphanage to fulfill its mission to let these children be loved. So I'm not throwing that out as a rhetorical will you go with me? I'm saying will you go with me? Who will sign up to go? Who wants to know more? Come and see me and we're going to talk, we'll talk about putting a trip together. The second uh, 
foreign mission opportunity that I want to talk about uh, is in Kenya. I have a friend whose name is Bishop Stephen Chege. He's from Kenya and he's taking the gospel around Kenya and Uganda. He goes out and talks to people that people haven't been. He's taking the gospel out into the villages and helping start churches. And he's a Kenyan from Kenya. And an amazing man. In fact, someone asked me, I mean, I'll tell you what, if I had to name one person that I thought was the most spiritual person I knew on the planet, um, he's the one to my left, or up here my left. I get always confused on that. Is that one. Um, I have watched something that I've never seen in my life before. You know, the Bible talks about spiritual healing. And when we talk about spiritual healing, I mean somebody laying hands on somebody, praying for them, and they're healed. And I'm going to speak only for myself, not for you. Did I believe it? Yes, because the Bible says it's it's true. The Bible says we're to do that, right? Jesus said, you know, you have the same power as I have because you'll receive the Holy Spirit. You can go out. We all believe that, mostly, kind of, probably. But I had an opportunity at my last church. We had a lady with brain cancer. And, I mean, had been fighting it for two years. And it was not getting any better at all. Was losing the battle. He came, laid hands on her, prayed for that to be taken away. She had a scan the next week, and there was no cancer in her brain at all. The doctors were so confused and dumbfounded, they did three more scans the next three weeks because it didn't make any sense. It was not humanly possible that that would go away like that. That it just would be gone. And she knew the answer. And it it made me and it made our congregation kind of go, oh, wait a minute. It's not just something that's talked about in the Bible. It's not just something in theory. It's true. I mean, you've got to wrestle with it when you're confronted like that and go, oh, I can't just think it's a nice thing. This is a man that is making a difference in places where we can't go by ourselves. My other favorite story is uh, one of the things we did. The gentleman here on the end served a church uh, and he was wanting to get, going to get out of ministry because he couldn't feed his family with the church. One of the big things was is he had a mud church, had a church built out of mud, and about a half mile away there was a church of Christ where there was a brick building. And, and this kind of may seem silly to us, but I, I was thinking about it just this morning and thought, well, we see some of that in our, in our country right now. But people were going to the brick building because their thought was, well, gosh, okay, you got... These, this church over here, well, their God only has a mud church, and this church over here, their God has a brick church. I'm going to go to that church. So what did we do my last church? We built him a brick church. And he's still in ministry today, and the gospel is being spread because we showed Christ's love. We went over there and met with these ministers. We met him. And my last church built a church so that he could continue to spread the gospel. What are we going to do to help spread Christ's mission from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth? I want to put together a trip to Africa too, to Kenya. I want to know who wants to go with me. And obviously, I'm not saying we're going to have one next week and then one the week after. We'll plan these in the next, within the next two years. But I want to hear who wants to go do Christ's work. You know, but I understand. I know there's some of you that say, well, I'm not going to Africa or Ecuador. I can't do that. Uh, my health isn't good. My age, I don't want to hear age, though, really. I, uh, But you can help financially support those who can. And that's just as important. It's just as important. Because you have that in life, right? There's some in our congregation that can go and do that, but may not have the resources to be able to do that. And there's some in our congregation that have the resources, 
but just can't physically do that. And that's the power of being church, of coming together and putting those two together, the people that can and those that have the resources together that so they can go and do. How do you do that? I've been at churches that put together a missions trust, a trust fund where the interest pays out to do missions. I've been at a church that was a tithing church. 10% off the top had to go out to missions. Missions is the key to fulfilling what Christ has called us to. Bottom line is it comes back to, are we going to do what Jesus told us to do? Are we going to follow His Word and His ways or do what we think is best? A missions-focused church cares more about doing what Christ calls them to do than what they want for themselves. That gets back to where we have to choose. We have a choice. We have to make it. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, You have called us to go out and take Your Gospel from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. You did call us to form churches, but they're to be mission posts. They're to be a place where we prepare and equip people to go out. A place where we grow in our understanding and knowledge of Jesus Christ's words and His teachings so that we can go out. We come in to give You praise and glory so that then we can go out and share that message with those around us. Lord, help us to let, us, let it to soak in. Help us to catch that vision. The vision that You have for us. To be a people that take Your Word your love, the message of your Son's Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection out through our words, through our actions, through all we are. Help us to serve you. In Jesus' name.